Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you all. Uh, old friends out there and new ones I've yet to make. Um, so it is off the back of um, Peter's challenge that I want to talk to you. Um, if this will work. There we go. Lovely. So I'm going to talk to you, literally you, um, about the things you can do to step up and deliver, uh, to face the things that uh, Peter Hansford talked about, which are indeed very real. It's a very dynamic sector that we're supplying. And it is in our gift to make a difference and make an impact. So if you're not really inclined to step up and make a difference and take a risk, you can go and drink some coffee. For those of you who are, um, this should be hopefully fairly insightful to you, or at least confirm some of the things you probably already know. So without, uh, without proceeding uh, with, some co with, with some context, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the organisation that I now uh, work for. So I work for a company called BRE that's uh, not far off 100 years old. So it was established in uh, 1921. And for the first 70 odd years of its life, it was a government organisation. It is indeed completely unique. It is a science-based organisation that researches various aspects of the built environment and develops an evidence base from which it goes forward and makes a difference. And it makes that difference through uh, creating standards, doing training, developing tools, providing advice and all that kind of thing to help the professionals in the sector and to help organisations in the sector deliver better outcomes, build better things. That's our job and that's our place. On the last day of the, uh, I think it was a major government in the 90s, we were privatised along with a load of other stuff like AWE and a whole load of things. We were put in the hands of a, a, a trust, a charitable trust. And so what that means is that we do have a single shareholder, and that shareholder is the recipient of all the profits that we make as an organisation, because we are operate as a limited company, private limited company. And that shareholder, the trust, spends that money on new research. And it spends around £2 million directly on new research in the built environment, either back through the business, excuse me, or through uh, five university centres of excellence. So we're the largest funder of direct research in the built environment, as we can ascertain, certainly in, uh, certainly in, uh, in Europe. And we're quite a small organisation in many respects. Turn over about £50 million, employ about 650 people, largely in Watford. But as you can see by the inordinately pretty map behind me, we do tend to trot around the world with reasonable success. Um, we currently invoice around 73 countries, um, so about 35% of our turnover comes from international sources. And we've got two quite significant exports that are driven out of this intellectual content. So one is BREEAM, BRE Environmental Assessment Method. You may have seen this applied to buildings and, and other projects. So that's used in about 65 countries around the world. And the other one, which is something you guys, and I certainly didn't bump into too often in my, in my career, is the LPCB brand, so the Loss Prevention Certification Board brand. So if you're going to pull down one of these smoke detectors in here, you'll see our stamp on the back. So in order to sell fire detection equipment in about 70 countries around the world, they have to run for our laboratories in Watford because the insurance companies specify the standards that we have over time refined and uh, created. So importantly for, for you guys to understand is, you know, BRE is not a government organisation. It does stand on its own two feet. Yes, we do work for government, but we do work for money like everybody else. And if the money isn't good enough, we either don't bid the contract or, or we go and do something else. So just a bit of myth busting in case you thought we were a, a departmental beast that we are not. We are a private company owned by a, uh, a trust. So I've structured this, um, this presentation around top tips, really. So what can I tell you based on the adventures that I've been on and got right and wrong over the years? And what can I tell you based on the reflections I, I, can, uh, I can look back on for being at BRE a couple of years in the light of the um, movement in the construction industry and the necessary things? What can I give you as individuals and as companies as some, uh, some if you like, top tips? So I have four top tips. And the first one is... Embrace the digital agenda. Now, let's have um, some BIM Anonymous in the room. Who knows what this is? Right. So, project team, what you all need to do is to go away and find out what this is. I will give you some minor insights to it, uh, but it is the diagram that has been created by a couple of blokes. Um, Bew and Richards, which is the, the description of the journey that Peter was really talking about. So Peter was talking about, oh, BIM level three, and everyone's nodding sagely, yes, BIM level three, I know what that is. The reality is, uh, lots of people in the sector, and 
looking around the room, lots of us, don't quite know what that is. But I can tell you something, it is indeed coming. Well, certainly BIM Level 2 is coming, and it's coming right now. So all government projects going forward will be procured using this type of systemic view of projects. So we've got a whole bunch of prisons turning up, we've got a couple of big railways, and a load of other stuff that Peter was talking about. And this thing, this BIM thing, is going to inform the language of construction. Now, we have a choice here. We can say, yeah, right, Mars, I've seen this all before. This will never happen. Or we can go, hmm, that looks like something I should probably know something about. And I suggest you take route B, because um, I really do think this is going to underpin the dialogue across the value chain in construction. To start with, it will be about putting stuff together better. And people always throw out the old a a a a a sort of... Uh, anecdote that we'll stop drilling holes to put wires in where pipes are, <clears throat> but the reality is it becomes much more sophisticated than that. So step one is let's all work around the same set of data to build a really good thing and price the thing properly and get the right outcome. And further steps will be around the whole life value and how assets are operated. And we can look back into the catalogue of how they were built at any point in time and with some degree of accuracy work out what's going on. So I really urge people to engage with the BIM agenda don't wait for it to come along. And this is the sort of stuff that happens in the world of BIM. Um, this is a picture, clearly, of uh, some drives and pumps and stuff. And they appear in that drawing because the people that do drives and pumps and stuff would be bothered to create this, these images and this data in, in, the, in the virtual space. And they link back to the website so people can work out how, uh, what the capacities are of this particular uh, piece of kit. They can work out how big it is, to work out how big the floor area is to bolt it to, and all the good stuff that goes along with it. So this is about getting your Lego in the box. People aren't going to be able to build stuff with your bricks if the bricks aren't in the Lego box. So step one would be jolly sensible to understand what is the interface between the spread of uh, products that you have as an organisation interfacing with this, uh, with this new world. And this is not something you'll be able to do by Thursday. This will require a great uh, degree of thought. But it is indeed something that needs to be taken pretty seriously. And I think you're probably familiar with these images a bit more. Um, so these are outputs from, uh, from various projects. So the top one, I believe, looks like Tottenham Court um, Underground uh, Crossrail Interface, which, as you can see, is a real box of horrors. Imagine doing that job without any reasonable insight in a digital space. Lots of head scratching and saying, sorry, I imagine would be the other outcome. So no, no substitute for a decent diagram. And clearly the bottom is a typical output from a building. But, but going forward, in all seriousness, bidding for work, being very helpful to the construction value chain, will come from a deep understanding of outputs like this, of, of, of uh, shared visions, if you like, literally visions of what a project uh, should be like. So don't be surprised in future that instead of getting several sheets of A4 paper that's some kind of scan that says, can I have X tons of this and Y tons of that, someone just gives you a thing and says, I'm trying to build this, what can you do for me, please? That would be an intelligent way to make an interface with the market in front of you. Again, everyone has choices here. I don't think we need to be uh, uh, so, so uh, arrogant to say, well, quite honestly, there'll still be loads of holes in the ground to fill. Yes, clearly there will. But all government projects, and increasingly all projects run by major forward-thinking clients, will be in the digital space. So someone, if it's not you in your organisation, in fact many people, need to be conversant with how this works in the digital space. Peter also talks about this. Um, and this is really an image for me that represents engagement of people in the workplace. So what you see on the screen is... Um, a screenshot of uh, something called Yellow Jacket, which is an acquisition that we made at BRE uh, a few months ago. And it's a safety management tool. Now, safety management software tools are not a thing to hide behind to make safety sort of go away and make it better. But you know what? It might just make it a bit more engaging. So I suggest, and another part of this top tip on Embrace the Digital Agenda, is why don't we find ways between us to use digital tools in the workplace to, to, frankly, just make it more fun. There's a whole host of people out there that have their own devices, they're playing around with stuff all their time, they're chatting to their mates, and this stuff gets easier and easier and easier and easier to use. So I am a firm believer of the opinion that we should be embracing this and bringing it into our working lives. It's not all perfect. You always wish they did something else that they don't do, but that is not a reason to not engage um, in this space. And of course, as every day goes by, new generations of people come in who have been born into this space. It's not weird, it's not unusual, it's just normal. 
Having said that, of course, there's plenty of people at the other end of their career for whom this makes life much more simple. And I was just reflecting on this the other day, actually. I've, I've just set my parents up in the world of Google Drive and Google Docs, thinking, oh, my God, what the hell is going to happen now? But actually, they're that new to the digital space, so they haven't got loads of stuff they need to unlearn. I know it sounds a bit weird, but a ton of us have been brought up on Microsoft products and everything else. So we've got this embedded way of, of, of the way stuff works. But, of course, they've not been ruined by that experience. So we've been able to introduce them to something new, something very simple. So regardless of where people are in their demographic curve and where they are in their career, this sort of stuff turns life into something that's quite practical and quite fun. In all seriousness, on something like safety, it's dead good because you can go, what, where did this happen? Here. Dump. We don't have to look around ourselves and try and describe a place uh, where something may or may not have occurred. So we don't need to worry about detail right now, but as a method of engaging uh, with the workforce and, and finding, you know, like I say, need to say, reasonable and entertaining ways to go forward and meet the policy objectives you might have as an organisation, the digital space can be harnessed to some quite, uh, quite good, effect, good effect. So it's absolutely uh, worth exploring, and I, I urge you to do that. As you'd expect me to say... Um, Social media is something that also needs to be grasped with both hands. Certainly in the early days of, of, of this type of uh, interaction with the world, um, lots of companies went, right, we'll have one channel. It will be Dave. He works in marketing. Nothing leaves our organisation unless it goes through Dave. He will sanitise it. And off we went down that particular route. And I think what we've learned over the course of time is that that's quite limited. And the best way to do it is to draw some breath arm some people across the organisation and let them get at it. Clearly, the more people that are communicating with the world from the organisation, the bigger the surface area is and the more effect you can make. And do you know what? It's quite good fun. I know I've used the word fun more than once in the last five minutes, but why go to work and take a load of pain? Why not enjoy it? Crazy thought. But, you know, this sort of thing is quite entertaining. Clearly, it is not without risk. It's not about risk. You can get caught up in dialogue about trucks going the wrong way up wrong streets and dust emissions and all the kind of stuff that doesn't go well in life. But they would have found you anyway, one way or the other. So it's got to be better to be operating in a space with a free throw of information between yourselves and the outside world and the different sort of uh, stakeholder groups. And I've, and I've, and I've stuck um, Semex up here um, because as I'm waiting for trains and thumbing down my Twitter feed and various other bits and pieces, I just thought I'd just mention Semex because I think they do a really good job in this space, certainly from the, from the company end of things. There's a, a, you know, good traffic around, um, around bicycles and lorries and that kind of stuff. You know, there's, there's a really proactive program here. So if any of you in the room are from, from Semex, well done. I think you're really on, on your game. Um, but nonetheless, I, like I said, I don't think this is really necessary corporate tool per se all, every day. You know, everyone run, runs you know, business units or a ton of people running business units. They all have neighbours. Neighbours can then talk to you on the way home on the train. They don't have to like come and bang on the door or write you a letter. It's just a really good way to work in modern society. So I would get hold of it with both hands and give it a good old shot. Almost nothing to fear um, in this space. And <laughs> third use of fun. So, so this is an output from us, actually, from BRE. Um, and we're on the same journey. So, so historically, you know, we, everything's gone out through the, the, the bloke, Pete, actually, he's not called Dave, a bloke called Pete in our business. But, you know, we're trying to give people a voice because an organisation isn't just a name. It's not just Semex or Agri Industries or, or Caterpillar. It's a bunch of people. And people quite like people because they're quite peopley. So, therefore, putting people at the front of all these comms is not a bad thing. So... Who have we got here? I uh, can't remember. Joe, I think. Yeah. So, Joe, a lady called Joe in, in our marketing department, you know, we give her a voice and she reaches out to someone else in her organisation and the whole thing becomes much more personable. You're not hiding behind the corporate machine and you're not hiding from life. You're getting out there and taking part. And do you know what? A whole tonne of people won't do this, so run for the hills. But the opportunity is there to create some kind of personality. And if you think... I think back to my early days in the, in, 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 the, in the aggregate sector, you know, go back 20 years, you know, it was dominated by a small number of seriously massive personalities. And over the course of time, you know, the character of the industry has changed. And those personalities are sort of people that walked into a room and they really filled the room, commanded an enormous amount of respect. And I think we'll see that again, but we'll see it digitally. And if you look at the cross-construction and look at the voices that are being heard all the time, you're seeing a new generation of sort of like mega voices out there who are just not the kind of human beings that you would have seen historically, because this is a totally different way of interacting with the world. But for all of you, literally as individuals, there's a massive opportunity here to create yourself, if you like, as a professional in this space and advocate and make change. So that was tip number one, embrace the digital agenda. Number two, 
which I've called uh, collaboration or be close to your customers. The most obvious thing you could possibly do, but massively overlooked at both ends of the spectrum. Over here, hygiene, answering the phone, doing all that basic stuff. And over here, being seriously intellectual and deeply helpful to people on a, on a, on a higher level. But I, what I will do is I'll start with a story that was being uh, related to me by a bloke called Simon Barker, who's a uh, project director at Balfour Beatty. And he's working on this uh, jolly, well, pair of jolly seaside projects up in the, uh, in the northwest, so Russell and uh, An Anchor's home up near Fleetwood. And the story he was telling me here is there's a whole bunch of people in the room and elsewhere in the sector that are supplying this job. And I thought it was worth relaying to you because what he said was this. He goes, we engaged early with the quarrying sector in this project. And through dialogue, we worked out what the outputs were from the sites we were working with. So instead of ringing up and saying, I'll have some big stuff about this far across, please, they said, well, what do you actually produce, as a matter of fact, off the kit that you have? How can we use that in this project? So actually, for a period of time, there are a bunch of sites uh, from, where are they from? From AI, from Jennings, Armstrong Hansen, up in that part of the country. They're almost running at a zero waste piece. Because these guys in this project are using everything from the dust right through to the rock armor. And I thought that was pretty cool, actually, to be honest. Um, and that came through having a sensible conversation and being in early. It came off the back of good relationships. And quite honestly, it came off the back of people that could be bothered to make a difference. So this bloke and some people from our sector have got together and made a difference. They could have not done that, and not doing it happens quite a lot. But it did happen. I don't think anyone waited for a head office memo. It happened. And I thought that was a really excellent story. But what it does show is a thorough understanding of the customer's need. That's what is at the hub of this. And there's a whole load of things that, that, that come from our organisation and elsewhere that cu uh, your customers and the clients are working towards. So we've got Bream, I mentioned before, Home Quality Mark, which is the new home version of Bream, comes out next week. SQL, which is another thing we bought uh, Monday, in fact. Quite new, quite exciting. Um, so whether it's these things or other things, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter right now. But having a detailed understanding of what the problem is you're trying to solve is not the same as selling a bunch of rocks to somebody else. And getting on the front foot and getting under the skin of what the challenge is, I think, is fundamentally important and I think really makes a difference between a normal supplier and someone who's really on their game. No corporate process will lead to this. This is down to the actions of the individual to grasp the ball by the horns and, and make a difference. So if you are talking about these sort of schemes, you think to yourself, right, well, what do I need to know? Well, I probably need to understand how my stuff fits into it. What questions am I going to be asked? And in return... What benefits can I bring the, uh, the customer of, of, the, of, of my mineral-based products in this particular context? How do they fit in the scheme directly? How do they fit with everything else in the scheme? What benefits do they make over the whole life of the product? Thinking through the, the, the challenge here, I think, is fundamentally important. And some of these challenges are really, really difficult. So this image is, a, um, is, is an illustration of the stuff, the balance scorecard that high speed two are trying to achieve. Now, you don't need to worry about the detail of it right now, but what it says is, right, we've got to reconcile some social uh, benefits, we've got to reconcile some environmental impact that we can't really sweep under the rug, and we've got to make a shared load of money. So it's looking at a balance of how all these things are, are going to take place based on a vision, but funneling right through to a bunch of procurement criteria. So all this vision will filter through to some things that need to be done by some people. So this is just an illustration of how a comprehensive understanding of the job you're supplying is very, very important. Because unless you're paying attention to the detail, you will miss stuff. You will miss value that can be added. Uh, myself and Colin, wherever he is over there, we had a lot of experience of this back in the day supplying the Olympics. And, you know, to be fair, Colin's team, which I supported uh, to the best of my ability, you know, we... we you know, that, that team won the uh, Olympic job off of an unbelievable attention to detail around the, uh, the needs of the ODA from an environmental and social perspective through using things like Bream and SQL, what does it mean to our products, therefore, how do we need to literally deliver this stuff, but more theoretically, how do we need to offer the client a, a solution? And I think it really does make a difference. And more and more projects are going to become more and more complicated in this way. And again, it's like, oh, it looks a bit tough, I'm just going to supply footings for housing. Or no, do you know what? I'm going to step up and have a go at this, learn and understand what the pressures are on these clients and deliver a solution. Peter mentioned... Um, 
the body that lives after Peter, in fact, uh, the, the, the new regime that will be looking at construction at a very senior, very grown-up, very formal level. But I'll tell you what, there's a ton of guerrilla organisations out there you can get involved in. So if you can't, get, uh, if you can't penetrate the construction council because it all looks a bit, a bit tough um, and, you, and, and you know, it's difficult for you to do as an individual, there's a load of other places where cross-supply chain thinking and action happens. And quite frankly, I've watched many different sort of very high-level bodies operate over the years. And do you know what? Sometimes absolutely nothing penetrates down here. So there's every opportunity, every opportunity to start here and go that way and make them look good. And when they look good, you get promoted, which is a total winner. So, you know, there are many opportunities. And I've put you know, some examples on the board there. Green, um, UK Green Building Council cross-supply chain representation, supply chain school, largely contractors, very interesting bunch of people to the people in this room. They are the people that are physically going to build HS2 and all the other projects. APRE, that's a responsible sourcing network, and I'll come on to that in just a moment, but that's a real stronghold for this sector. So I encourage you to go and drink in the right bars with the right people because you learn lots of stuff, you find out who the movers and shakers are, and good relationships will be formed, and it will hold you in, uh, in good stead. So that was top tip number two, collaboration, know who your customers are. Number three, again mentioned by Peter, mentioned a lot. And it's mentioned a lot because it's a bit like BIM, really. That's because most people don't really understand what it is. They go, oh, yes, we're very innovative, brilliant. And, um, <clears throat> and often that, that's not the case. And I can't profess to be a total genius in that space, but I do watch some things going on which I do think are quite interesting. And let's not, let's not confuse innovation for, for something that is utterly transformational on Monday week. This is about showing that you have the intellectual capacity to go and do something unusual, to make a dent, to make a difference, that you are able to think through a problem, take a bit of a risk and everything else that goes with it. And more importantly, work with other people beside you in the industry. Now, one of the things I utterly, utterly fail to achieve in my career at Agri-Industries is to do well in this particular space. So it is unlikely that anything anywhere will be built out of one material. It is highly likely it will be built out of many materials. Therefore, we've got some mates over here and some mates over here that when we get together, create things. And I, was, uh, I urge you to be vastly more successful in this space than I was. Um, and, uh, and I'll show you some examples of how others are having a go. Do not confuse these with things of perfection. I'm just throwing them out of ex as examples. So... Oops, yeah, there we go. So, so these, are, these are piling and beam systems that are, belong to bullivants, actually. And so what do they do then? Well, they, what they're trying to do is to provide uh, the base of properties and all the houses on our innovation park, which I'll come on to in a minute, are built on these types of systems. They're very well insulated. They give a U value of uh, 0.15, which is a jolly good start. And they're quite fast, honestly, because instead of digging a big hole and filling it full of concrete, you dig some smaller holes and put some sticks in the ground and build upon it. I think it's quite good fun. But you'll notice it's not just a massive lump of concrete. There's a whole lot of other stuff in there. These guys have thought through what the application might be and the problem, uh, what the problem is they're trying to solve, found some mates in, in related sectors, so there's some steel in there, there's some insulation and other, other bits and pieces, and come up with a solution. And that looks pretty intelligent to me. Do you know what? They might not sell that many, but, it, but what we're doing is we're saying, we can do this. And I think that sort of signalling is fundamentally important. And one day, something will make a big breakthrough. Something on a slightly different scale, this is Wienerberger's uh, E4 house. And it's an E4 house because um, all the E's mean something. So you've got energy in there, so it's a low energy build. Uh, you've got environment in there because the, uh, the embodied impact of the final solution is pretty reasonable. You've got E for economy because actually it's, uh, it's quite honestly pretty affordable. And you've also got emotion. Those are the, three, the four E's because, you know what, it's quite a nice house. So emotionally it gets hold of you. Now, you will notice that Wienerberger are indeed a brick company. And in the picture you see here, there are more than bricks. So, guess what? They had to go and find some mates beside them in the industry who do other things that were quite helpful to provide an end result. And they've created something called the uh, Homes for Life Consortium, uh, which is looking at, at taking this to market where it's applicable, talking to lots of housing associations and private developers and various other bits and pieces. So, for all those organisations that do windows and doors and soffits and various other bits and pieces, they've taken them along with them and they've formed this product and they've gone to market. Again, will they sell 9 million of these? I doubt it, but they'll do a few, but it's a big flag to the market to say, we're prepared to step up and put something innovative uh, in, the, in the marketplace. And this is daring, because like the people in the quarrying sector, there's an awful lot of humans between you and the client, and they've just leapt right over the top and put a solution straight into the, into the client space. 
which might look kind of terrifying, uh, but that is the step they've decided to take. So, so what you saw being, uh, being built there was, was this. And this is, um, as you saw, an off-site constructed property built in mid Wales. Um, and uh, you can see it fully clad there. But that went from not existing to being watertight in one day. Clearly, I didn't want you to sit here all day to watch that. That's why we speeded it up a little bit. But there was no funny business on that video. That was all in a single day. It came in in one, two, three, five units. And then it was built. It can be dressed in the local vernacular, so you can hang the stuff on the side, whatever you like, brick slips or timber or whatever cladding you want to fit in. So this is another example of, of, of something that's reasonably innovative. And again, this is a coming together of actually companies from all over the world to provide a solution. And there's all kinds of other fun stuff on this project I won't go into now, such as the roof, which is a built-in photovoltaic system. So instead of there being those funny panels of aluminium bits around the outside on the tiles, it's built in the roof. But it's just an example of what's out there and what can be done. And, it, of course, it addresses what Peter talked about precisely. There is a need in construction or, or, or a desire in construction to come up with repeatable solutions. Repeatable solutions. So the history of the quarrying sector, of course, is in the, in the bespoke space in many respects. So this is not about having an argument about which is better. This is about getting ahead around the fact that there is a desire to get that kind of outcome. And we need to embrace and understand what, what that is, not run away from it. Interesting, the final example in this space I, I'll use before I move on to my uh, final tip is, uh, is, this, is a, this is coming to our innovation park soon. This is something called solid space, and what it is is an infill property. Uh, it's only 40 square metres, but you can see it's three storeys, so you get loads of natural light and the feeling of enormous space. So when you're developing in an urban context, of course, the gap's very narrow, and 40 square metre properties are unbelievably tiny, as you well know. So using this triple floor system, it gives you a much, it gives the illusion of much better space. And the good news for everyone is this is an in situ concrete poured uh, solution. So we have one of these coming to the Innovation Park soon, working with a company that's represented in this room. So it can be done. It can be done. So last tip then, um, I'm calling it be accountable. So stand up and be counted and take responsibility for yourself and the decisions that you make and the actions of your organisation. So what have I put in this box? Well, number one, um, I put that up as, a, I guess, a, a proxy for, for safety. And in this case, product safety. So we all went through the pain in the sector of having to see mark our products. Most of the conversation was around why do we need to bother? This all looks really hard, you know, seriously, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> but without doubt, without doubt, there is a big train that's already left the station which says society will become more interested in where stuff comes from, what its effects are on society and the environment. And there's nobody in this room and not all of us together are going to be able to put a junction into that train track and move it over there. So this train has left the station and transparency and accountability for what we do is up there and alive and kicking. And there's been a long history of activity in, our, in this space. You know, things like quality management systems. Just pay attention to the latest edition on this. You will no longer be able to blag your way through the senior management bit that we've all sat down and done. Same with 14,001. Big success in the sector. Many organisations have this. 18,001 becoming more popular, so that's the safety element, which in a minute will actually turn into a... Uh, uh, a, a, an ISO, so really big success there for everybody. Increasingly, um, responsible sourcing. So I remember proudly, before I became a BREist, achieving uh, certificate number one in this space. That was quite exciting. And this is really the comings together of all of our organisational efforts in terms of our managing our impact on the environment and managing our impact on society and making a declaration of how committed we were. So it brings everything together um, very neatly. And something coming over the hill you need to be aware of, 
if you're not already, and for some of you this will be relevant, for others less so, but not irrelevant, to every, uh, but relevant in some capacity to everybody. It's something called the Modern Slavery Act. So as of um, March next year, every organisation that's registered in Britain that turns over more than £36 million needs to have a signed statement from their executive team available directly from the website that talks about how modern slavery is tackled in their business and how it's tackled in their supply chain, the broad supply chain. So where does your stuff come from? Who makes it? How do you know there's not bonded labour involved? And what steps are you doing to try and eradicate that situation? It's not saying make a statement to say there isn't any, because if everyone said that, they'd all be lying. So this is a situation that everyone needs to be aware of. This is a new thing. I think it's crept up very quietly. Maybe I haven't been paying attention, but hey, what do I know? But it's something that's really worth uh, thinking about. And for those organisations in the room that are making things in distant lands, they could be parts, they could be, uh, yeah, they could be whole pieces of kit, it could be people involved in dimensional stone import from India, China, lesser oil regulated regimes. You need to start thinking through this. And I'm not going to stand here and profess to give you uh, all, all the solutions, but you do need to be aware of what this means uh, to your organisation. Close to home, um, we have a system now which is managed by Europe, really, which is about declaring the environmental impacts of products. I won't go through the, through the unbelievable levels of detail here. But going forward, in the world of BIM, um, questions, more questions will be asked around what are the direct impacts of making your products, Mr. Manufacturer? And there is no better way to deal with this than to have a, a what they call an environmental product declaration, a certificate of numbers, basically, that says, look, I've had a bunch of folks come in and look at this and verify that I'm telling you the truth. Here is all the data for the impact of my products. And a whole load of people in the room have, have worked on this. But increasingly, this stuff will be sucked into those digital BIM tools. And increasingly, they will be used to differentiate between your product and somebody else's. So let's say you've got your Lego in the box. So we've now got two bricks to pick from that are the same. How do I make a choice? Well, there's a bunch of different parameters, and a load of those parameters will be in the impact of products. So it is something to be aware of and understand and embrace. The river, a further step to this, and this thing of beauty behind me is from the um, Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So she sailed around the world, had some interesting moments with herself on the boat and thought, I'm going to come back and do some, uh, do some world-saving stuff. And in the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, they spent a lot of time and money thinking about what's something called the circular economy. Okay, So this is about keeping stuff in flight. So we've already dug it out of the ground, we've already grown it. Let's just see how long we can keep things going round and round in circles so we don't have to get any more new stuff. It is obviously a little bit more complicated than that, but that is essentially what the essence is. And interestingly... Um, I found this from one of the uh, organisations represented in the room, which is, which is the beginnings of uh, thinking in this, in this direction. And what it does here, it basically says, look, we can, we can build stuff out of concrete, and it's really cool, because what we'll do is we'll smash it to pieces and make, make new concrete bits out of it. But, of course, the sector is missing a trick, and that trick is this. So this is a, uh, this is a, a building in, in London. Um, it's, it's been put up, I think, in the, in the late 60s, and it's largely a concrete building, and Bennett's Associates refurbished it to be this. And you think, well, that's not particularly dramatic. But it happens a lot. It happens all the time now. So more and more clients are looking at uh, the buildings they've got and going, do you know what, I've got two choices here. One is I can refurbish what I've already got, and the second thing is I can chuck it down and throw it away. And I'm having more and more and more conversations about the former and vastly fewer about the latter. And people are saying, well, do you know what, I'll save a massive load of embodied carbon if I keep the existing frame. This is a massive winner to the heavy side. You know, concrete in particular performs brilliantly in buildings, it regulates the thermal temperature, it lasts a long time, all the battery attributes that we know... The great is, obviously, you think, well, hang on a minute. If they're doing that, they're not buying any more concrete from me. That's a bit of a shame. So we have to get heads around this agenda. And so going, nah, nah, you're doing the wrong thing, mate. You're doing the wrong thing. Knock it down, build a new one. You might find you're going 90 degrees to the way people are trying to think. So my suggestion is to go away and try and think unto yourself about how you embrace the circular economy agenda. And there's just a bunch of stuff here. So this is uh, council offices down in Winchester. This is a bit more dramatic. Same architect. They went from this to this. So there's no... Uh, I'll go back again because I just saw some interesting faces from this to this, real. Um, so, you know, again, this is reusing, exposing, certainly internally, the, the concrete soffits and, and frame to regulate the cooling of the building. They could have bulldozed this site and started again, but no, we'll use the material for what it's good at, 
massive uh, uh, winner. And the last one I'll show you in this space um, is um, this is a British uh, Crown Estate development down in down just off Regent Street. And this is a refurbished building, and they stripped everything out of it, put a lot more concrete back into it. And it's got the high, even even though it's a listed building, even though it's a refurbishment, it's got the highest Bream score ever. So you don't need to build new stuff to build good stuff. So we'll see more and more of this stuff in the metropolitan centres around which a lot of quarries and renovated concrete plants are. I guarantee you, we will see more and more refurbishment. So that is an agenda we need to understand how to deal with, and I encourage you to. Uh, to think through, to innovate in that space. So that's me. Uh, so I talked about embracing the digital agenda. Embrace it from the customer perspective, the society perspective, the employee perspective, personally. Make yourself a star. Go for it. Be a personality. I talked about collaboration. There is no substitute for getting under the skin of your customer and knowing in detail what the challenge is, what the client's asking them to do what you as a supplier of solutions can do to help them out and get them promoted and make yourself look good in the process, which is not the same as explaining why things can't be done. Take responsibility and accountability of your own actions and indeed those of the organisations and the products that you put out there. Be transparent, step up, declare your performance and make it better. And also think of new ways think out of the box, understand how to embrace the agenda that Peter has described, which is not going to go away anytime soon. The world simply uses too much stuff, throws too much stuff away, and is not very efficient. If you look at the construction statistics, it produces a little bit less than 10% of the output for the UK, but employs a little bit more than 10% of the people. So you think, well, what does that tell us about our efficiency? What do we need to do to drive that up? And there I will leave you. Thank you very much. Thank <clears throat> you.